Hi, I am Chua Isabel Marie O, and this is I am a first year BSMLS student. Um, this is the final PowerPoint presentation. It's a final requirement for IT era. I will be covering chapter 14, which is managing media literacy. So the intended learning outcomes. So what I wrote here is to understand what media literacy is, searching for information and how misinformation can cause negative effects to those who can who come across it. Validating credible sources upon searching information for research, understanding copyright issues, and the lesson summary. So what is media literacy? It is the ability to access, analyze, and evaluate, create media in variety forms of communication. It is how people perceive media and evaluate data to identify types of media and to understand the messages they're trying to send. Understanding the reason of one's form of media is the basis of media literacy. So, media literacy is not just one form of media. Um, it can be published articles, it can be published uh, journals, or it can be videos, uh, platforms actually, or blog posts. Uh, there's different kinds of forms of media. It can be uh, video, text, art, everything. And how we interpret it is what is the basis to understand the reason. Uh, we can understand the author's reasoning for why they put out that work or why this artist put out that work. And I feel like that is the form of media that's very important in media literacy. So the, one of the most fundamental insights of media literacy is that the form of a medium influence how we read or experience a text. While this remains true in digital media, the network effect means the architecture of a platform. Everything from the user interface we interact with to the algorithm that determines how it delivers content to us affects not just the meaning of the message, but of digital media of our own behavior when using them. So for media literacy, um, it's, it, it influences how we read or how we perceive a text. Um, it's how we interact with different algorithms and how, how it delivers content to us. And it will be further elaborated when I talk about search engines and how things become more accessible to us while it gains our personal information, how, uh, how it becomes relevant to us. But here, it changes our behavior. It affects our behavior when we look at that content. So persuasive intent of advertising and resist the techniques that marketers sell a product to an audience because of how people are to perceive and evaluate the data, we can identify point of view of the creator and that media and their intention behind it. Um, so I think one thing that I can cite with this is that most advertising in the Philippines, um, I think because there's a very big market for it, is about beauty brands and the way that they sell their beauty brands is how they, um, is how they, is how they power insecurity um, to their buyers. That's why they always push this narrative that white skin is more beautiful than dark skin or being uh, looking more chinita is better than looking more morena. Um, so I think a lot of people have spoken out about this and they understand the intention of what these markets are trying to do. They're trying to sell their product, but in the end, they're trying to use our insecurity to influence us to buy their product. So this is how we evaluate the data and the intention behind how the market likes to manipulate the audience to sell their items better. So often, media speaks in biases. It means that a particular news station can cover particular news stations unlike... So um, this wasn't added, but media often speaks in biases. And I can say that this is true. Um, most media will usually... Um, they'll usually cover just one form of the news. They're not covering all aspects of the news. So this causes a lot of people to um, have misinterpret or misperceive. They can't. They they're misperceiving the um, the issue because of uh, how the news speaks so biased towards it. So we can, uh, for say, an example. Uh, for churches, especially Christian churches, um, they would love to advocate about 
um, their own bias, their own beliefs, but it's not necessarily covering what people believe. So it's not very open-minded. So it's like news stations, they don't cover all aspects of the area, or sometimes they don't even wish to cover uh, the remaining problems in third world countries or other countries suffering from war. They often speak in biases that, no, they're okay, this is fine, but like um, uh, to cite an example with COVID-19, they were not able to, they never, they never acknowledged that COVID-19 was a real pandemic until um, everyone, almost everyone in America was getting affected. There were, the death rate, the death toll was rising. They often speak in biases with their own belief. It doesn't cover everything. And so that's it. So the questions you should ask yourself when evaluating media literacy. Who created this? Why did they make this? What is the message for? Is this source credible and believable? So um, this will also be elaborated later on the other slides, but when you ask who created this, it's asking whether the person behind the article or behind the media source, if, they're create, if, they, are, if they are acknowledged or they're credible as an author to, to release those things, if, uh, if people can trust them. And so why do they make this? What's their intention behind it? If their intent, um, why, why would they make something like this? Do they want to spread the news around? Do they want to make awareness of an issue? Um, what's, their, what's their intention? So this also the same as what is the message for? Is the message good? Is the message bad? Is the message citing reasonable, reasonable uh, outcomes? Like um, we wanted to, we wanted to focus an area on dark skin women, and we wanted to show that their skin is more acceptable and very beautiful, you know. And they add another person who's brighter in skin. Uh, most people will think that, oh, I don't like this, you know. Of course, it's white skin who's more beautiful, but actually, the message behind that commercial or advertisement is that. People are both equal, so that's how you should do it. You should evaluate what the message is for, even if it's a commercial that is um, that's kind of controversial. You st it's still good to see what the message is for. So, is the source credible and believable? Um, this can be this can be covered by news articles and news stations or research articles. Um, you always have to see, like like they said, who created this. Um, the author has to be credible. They have to be acknowledged for their previous works and um, how they how they acknowledge in the media. If they're highly praised, if they're not, you know. So searching for information. Almost everyone at every age bracket has has have depended the usage of online material. Not all information can be deemed credible, nor they can be verified that their data is proven right. So it doesn't matter what age you are. Um, let's say given the age 14, 20, early 20s, mid 20s, 30s, even people up to their elderly, they have depended on online uh, information to gain proper knowledge or to gain some insight. Um, I, I also wanted to cite that then my next point is it causes the great danger of misinformation how people are to perceive this without any factual record. So I wanted to give an example. There are some people who would rather trust online articles, which is why this this uh, writing this report hits very hard for me. There are a lot of people who have who have experienced issues in their body, they would rather look online than trust a healthcare professional over how they how can they evaluate their illness. They would rather search online. And this will further cite that most people who are who are in the in the belief of anti vaccination, they are also in the belief that because they read a Facebook post or they read an article online, they can trust it, you know. They wouldn't they wouldn't inquire a healthcare professional who has dedicated their life to learn the health of children, to learn the health of every adult, you know. But it it's also it's also a tragic situation that the kids are being dragged onto the belief of the parents, you know. The misinformation, the bias of people who are like, well, vaccines are not good. Vac vaccines cause autism. 
but the data is not proven right there's no factual record that date uh, that vaccines cause autism so that is the greatest danger of misinformation that a child they're not properly developing their immune system because of the inf misinformation that people spread due to their biases and their beliefs on vaccinations and it's very dangerous so like i said most notably are the news about medicine news coverage about corruption and bias views on the new coronavirus vaccine um i think with facebook especially a lot of people have spread a lot of rumors that coronavirus was a laboratory acquired infection so it 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 was created in the laboratory to sabotage people to hurt the to hurt the global pandemic you know but in reality it was really passed on by a bat and that um that bacteria of course or that pathogen transferred to a human being and affected the lungs which affected millions of people worldwide so it's people have also said that the new coronavirus was also invented by the government or how it's dangerous how you know we shall not get the vaccine religious religious entities have expressed that getting the covid vaccine is going to cause a lot of issues when that is spreading misinformation there's no factual record that that has happened so that's the that's the truth that because of bias views and the bias views and with proving things to proceed without any factual record is very dangerous because it hurts the people who are most vulnerable to believing those kinds of information so being able to find out more information online can serve as an advantage to gain knowledge for those who want more insight on but most reliable sources come from libraries scholarly journals and credited researches by people who obtain higher educational degrees so those being people who acquire their bachelor's until their master's to PhD and who have uh, released a lot of trusted material, trusted journals online or trusted research where they have sent surveys to acquire that data. Um, that's, that's where we should trust and libraries because they've uh, printed that onto a book. Um, you cannot just get any information online, so most trusted are recommended are libraries, scholarly journals, and credited researches by people who obtain high educational degrees. So a lot of information online can lead to disinformation, misinformation, and even a lot to hate speech. The quality of our information directly shapes the quality of our vision later leading to our decisions. So a lot of information can kind of cloud and corrupt us. Um, so it's very hard to form your own personal bias especially when you're young um so i believe that it's kind of the reverse now um usually we get our corrupted views and our values from our parents while they're not all corrupted a lot of the opinions of what parents can give are it shapes the child's way of thinking it, sh it shapes the child's way of feeling so if a child were to if a parent if a parent's religious values were higher to hate on the LGBT community, the child later follows because the quality of the information shapes the quality of the child's vision, leading to his decision to hate the LGBT community. So it's very important I think it's the opposite effect now. When people go online, they can form their own personal but, uh, opinions on how they feel about the LGBT community on their own you know as they get older as they are more independent from their parents they're able to think for themselves but most people who are very vulnerable uh they they can see a lot of information online and it shapes their vision it shapes how they say things how they decide on what to do on what to feel on a certain matter the negative aspects of spreading misinformation can cloud social media, especially when breaking news affairs break a headline. A lot of those misinformation that steadily spreads leads to fake news, causing unnecessary speculation and hysteric behavior. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, what year this was in specific, but there was um, it was uh, I, I think there was a subgroup of ISIS that went to a province in the Philippines and 
they were uh, they stayed here they uh, vacation they not vacation but they located here and uh, took a lot of people in captivity and a lot of people they spread this kind of information on Twitter that if this number calls you in specific then your phone is going to explode. So that's the kind of negative aspect of spreading a lot of misinformation and cause a lot of hysteric behavior. Um, so it's like saying the COVID-19 is going to lead to a zombie apocalypse. You know, There's no factual evidence. There's no truth in that matter because the only thing it causes is the detrimental, the, the detrimental effect of your lungs being affected where you can't breathe. You know, it, it won't cause any zombie apocalypse. So that's the negative, uh, I think that's one of the most negative aspects because it causes hysteric behavior all around social media, you know. It's not just one person or hundreds of people. It can be thousands of people spreading that information and hurting other people and making them worry. And yes, across boundaries outside of social media, reaching politic ideologies and perspectives. But as we navigate the web, we have the independence to evaluate the information we come upon and decide how we feel about it. So despite the information shared online, whether it, uh, it negatively affects us or worries us to the point of hysteric behavior, we can still have the independence to think for ourselves, to evaluate whether this is real, to evaluate whether we can trust this source of information. So, as with tra traditional media, these influences are not natural or neutral. They reflect beliefs, unconscious biases, and unquestioned assumptions of their creators. Sometimes these values will consciously apply if a platform designer considers freedom of speech their top priority, then protections from hate speech and harassment will be an afterthought at best, which will influence who feels free to speak and what kinds of conversations will happen. Uh, so here, um, a lot of people they have they have this idea that if they are if they're going to use uh, if they're going to use being open-minded or being uh, if they're more open-minded, they want to speak freely that still can allow to hate speech because regardless if you think you're you're spreading actual information but you're talking about racism you're talking about how you support racism that is still devaluing the importance of what how black lives matter it puts up this it it's it still powers racism it still activates why racism still exists because that is still hate speech that is allotting to why people don't take Black Lives Matter seriously? Why they? Why? How it will propagate? Uh, how it will propagate racist Americans or racist Filipinos to look down on people who are not their own nationality or their own race? You know. So people have also um, to also cite an important uh, matter is that some people have also used the idea that. If they're going to say they they have uh, they have been bullied in the past or they have uh, they have been cheated on in the past, you know, relatively they do it to another person. They'll use it as the reason. Well, I was cheated before in the past. I would never do something like that. You know, it's protecting or shielding them from something that they've already done. They cannot acknowledge the fault or they can they're neglecting the hurt that they cause other people. So sometimes those values may be consciously applied uh, to a lot of influencers, you know. They can't really own up to their mistakes. And usually, afterthought will be at best, which is an uh, issue. So search engine technology. So information retrieval. A user query prompts engines to return results, which are ranked hierarchically using trust and relevant signals. So web crawling browses the web in a methodol methodical, automated manner. So indexing pages are analyzed by titles, headings, and specific fields. This is the fastest form of search. So the most notable search engines are Google, YouTube, Amazon, Facebook, and Microsoft Bing. So um, I want to recite about I want to recite about Google. Okay, so with over 75% of the search search market share, one hardly needs to introduce readers to Google because everyone goes to Google if they want to search uh, information. So Google, the big appeal is that 
it has massive potential traffic. Um, remember, when it comes to search engines, they usually operate in a way that when you search in something, they will search relative to that subject, to your interest. So they'll usually gather your personal information and it takes only less than a second. And then they will give you other links uh, that, are, that are of that same topic. So the big appeal of Google is, like I said, the potential traffic. The downside is that everyone else wants this traffic. So making organic search the most is competitive and paid search often is more expensive than on other sites. Um, so people are usually fulfilling their needs and intents directly on Google, but um, a lot of it can, a lot of con a lot of cons can also be that sometimes the information they're given to us is not always important. It's not always relative. Um, it's not. It also wastes our time, you know. So that's the consequence. Um, so I'll talk about YouTube. So YouTube. So YouTube is about one of the most popular. It also allures the massive traffic, but it's also a pitfall for marketers and advertisers. Um, but for advertisers, it definitely helps that, especially I think out of all the websites, YouTube, YouTube um, besides Amazon, has the strongest search engine because it acquires to everyone's taste. So um, you can so so a video can be put onto your radar because uh, it can sense that you've been watching videos um, like like me. I love Tekken matches, so it will put a lot of videos of Tekken matches because that that is keen to my interest. Uh, YouTube works very fast on search engines, but using YouTube is also a vehicle of traffic. Uh, but it cannot be underestimated that its impact is very powerful. Um, YouTube, YouTube is very strong in that regard for a search engine because that's why it's one of the most popular websites. Everyone spends countless of hours because all videos, uh, all videos recommended to them are based on their personal search bar, what they want to watch, who they like, and what they do. So yeah. Um, Amazon. So uh, Amazon, they started selling books online, but it, it expanded rapidly. So unlike YouTube and Google, um, Google still search for items, but Amazon is more in touch with uh, selling it, uh, manufacturing items and, of course, the speed of looking for those relative items. Like if you are searching for party items, they will give you party materials and everything and the list goes on and on so Amazon is making online shopping very popular and accessible so um, it's shopping searches not only begins in Google but it really did begin in Amazon um, so the pros of the pros of it is that like Google if you sell if you sell things and you people search for them then you want to be on Amazon because your item will be on the search bar or your item will be listed there and it can be sold to the person um, although the although the consequence is that the competition is fierce there's a lot of global markets around and it's easy to compare and compete products um, entering Entering that kind of business is also a lot of a stretch, but I think Amazon is thriving very well. Uh, Facebook. So for Facebook, um, it's a it's usually it's usually a go-to when thinking of search engines. Uh, it surpassed two billion searches a day, so it puts ahead of Bing. So a lot of people they. Uh, I think YouTube has now integrated shops, like they sell items or they're trying to advertise more uh, products to sell people. They're also, adverti advertisers are going there to put advertise, uh, advertisements on videos so that not only the creator can earn money, but the advertisers get a lot of traffic from that as well. Uh, it also gives business and advertisers incredible market access and tends to be when they're not working. So it's a better situation. Although 
with Facebook, it's not really a. It, it's a. It's a. It's very visited. Uh, it helps with it. Navigates your search. It helps you search for who you like or the people you want to search for, like old classmates. It's more on the personal aspect of life. Unlike Amazon, it's for shopping. Unlike YouTube, it's for videos. But uh, Google is to search everything. So, yeah. Um, Microsoft and Microsoft Bing. So for Microsoft. It has a lot of place in advertising space to catch up with Google. Uh, it improves the functionality of their keyword matches. So a lot of people will search a certain keyword and a lot of uh, options will pop up. A lot of links will pop up to those kind of, to those, to the same kind of topics. Uh, so it doesn't really have a market like Microsoft Bing, but I think that's one of its cons, but it's still a reputable search engine at the very least. So using search engine in technology, so this is more further elaborated. To be able to make pages relevant to almost any query, thus page relevance is no longer a major issue. So it's derived from a user's personal information. So going back to the first point, because they gather from the personal information, it's able to make pages more relevant to us. So if I were interested in competitions uh, in Tekken, they're going to recommend me a lot of websites uh, or a lot of shops that, that offer tournaments locally because they know that's uh, more keen to my interest. Uh, so search engine software focuses on the material that matters for efficient and effective web search for queries. So uh, this kind of software focuses on the material that we like the most and it's more efficient and effective whenever we see internet. Like we're searching, uh, we are... Uh, like I'm searching for my subject in chemistry, then they're going to give me a lot of options. Uh, this is how you do clinical chemistry. This is how you do uh, these kinds of tests and everything. It's more atoned to what I like. And with search engines, you will be given links. So you, can, you must carefully evaluate those sites to know if the information is reliable. So search engines are going to recommend you a lot of sites. But obviously, like I've elaborated before, you must search everything and evaluate the data, whether they're credible or not. So understanding copyright issues. So the definition of copyright in the word itself, it is the right to copy it. Uh, it describes the legal rights of the owner of intellectual property. A person who holds a copyright to work, such as song lyrics or an original drawing, is the only person who can copy that work or grant permission to someone else to copy it. In addition to being able to assign their copyright, license it, or to use it for funding, copyright holders may also collect royalties when others use their copyrighted work. Um, so, some people, um, especially content creators or artists, they can be very inspired to create a piece that's very similar to what they like, but copyright focuses more on the law of stealing. Um, and people can push for uh, push press charges if their work is being illegally used without permission. Or with uh, if the person who copyrights their work, if they don't grant permission to those who use it, they can press charges. So the areas of copyright issues, so writings, books, articles, reviews, poems, essays, blog, plays, movies, and broadcasts. So a lot of people can copy excerpts from books. A lot of people can, um, they can plagiarize articles. Some people can even steal movie reviews and poems. Yes, tragically, a lot of people do do that. Essays for research and homework and blogs. Uh, they, uh, I think a lot of cooking, Blogs or baking blogs sometimes they steal each other's recipes. Uh, movies, yes, they pirate movies as well and broadcast. They stream broadcast even if they are copyrighted to a, a certified company. So website context, text, pictures, graphics, and even page layouts. Uh, those things can also be stolen and they can be copyrighted. Uh, computer programs, business, personal, and entertainment. Um, motion pictures, audios, movies, TV programs, and podcasts. So just like writings, um, I don't know why it's added there. Um, movies are often pirated, TV programs are often recorded and reposted, and I'm not sure about the market of podcasts, but with movies, I think that's one of the most harmful 
markets around there because I think a lot, a lot goes into making movies and yet uh, a, lot, a lot goes into making movies and yet people still pirate them and it's very harmful to those who direct the movies and those who don't receive the royalties because it is illegally pi pirated. So music links, uh, ly lyrics and instrumentals both recorded and performed. Um, so I think people can sample it if, if it is properly given permission. But some lyrics are stolen and reused again, and it's very hard to deal with that copyright issue because it might never, it might not necessarily be the same copyright. It might not be the same copyright. Um, it might not be the same song per se, but it can still have the same beat and tone. It it yes, people do bring each other to court for that and instrumentals. Um, so paintings, drawings, sculptures, graphics, maps, charts, and photography. Uh, paintings and drugs can often be copied and resold or some people would even resell them in conventions which is very tragic because the artists are often not made aware that their drawings are being resold in conventions or other stores you know in the Philippines. So it's so copyright differs from intellectual property because it is automatically created when a person creates a copyrightable work that is original liter literary, dramatic, musical, and artistic work. So copyright infringement. Copyright infringement is the use of production of copyright protected material without the permission of the copyright holder. So copyright infringement is basically using something without the permission. Individuals and companies who develop new works register for copyright protection to ensure that they can profit from their efforts. So they register for copyright because they want to be able to gain the royalties of what they do, especially if they're being used in other projects. They still want to gain that money because it is their work after all. Other parties may be granted permission to use their work through licensing arrangements or buy the works from the copyright holder. And I think that would be the best way. The U.S. Copyright Office defines copyright infringement such as, as a general matter, copyright infringement occurs when a copyrighted work is reproduced, distributed, performed, publicly displayed, or made into a derivative work without the permission of the copyright owner. So this is the basis of everything. Copyright infringement issues have varied over the years, but with rapid advances in technology, the Copyright Office has faced a growing number of issues in an effort to keep pace with innovation, thereby affecting creativity. So this is the last. Um, I will recite everything. Um, so media literacy is every kind of form of media. So all the topics I've talked about, it all is under media literacy. How we search for information, how we can... Uh, validate if information is credible and the different kinds of search engines and copyright issues. Um, I didn't add researching information because it's very similar to searching information so I just compiled both of them together in one that's why it, took, uh, it, it, it was long. But the lesson summary is that we cannot always perceive data or we cannot always perceive articles to be uh, to be credible. Uh, we must trust uh, we must trust our our intuitions in knowing if this article was published by someone who has been credible not only in their field of study but credible in their other works as well uh, and spreading misinformation is very cruel because it also causes a lot of hysteric behavior it also hurts a lot of people in the process because people don't know any better they're affected and I think the most Project case, like I elaborated, was people who are anti-vax, anti-vaccine believers. Uh, they are hurting their children in the most uh, tragic way because they are depriving them of developing their immune system to hurt them because of their beliefs, and it's very selfish. You know, uh, it, it doesn't provide any factual proof or evidence that. Well, a vaccine will cause autism, but it, there is no proof of that happening. So people who advocate those tend to manipulate the people who don't know any better, which is the most tragic in my opinion.
uh, and I talked about copyright infringement issues and um, I think with copyright a lot of people they put their soul and effort in their work um, it's not easy creating art or it's not easy uh, releasing music um, so when people use it and manipulate them manipulate the recording and make it as their own uh, especially like a big artist stealing from a smaller artist you know a smaller artist they can't really provide uh, the the legal support to get their work back or to get the or uh, to gain justice which is why copyright is so important because it solely belongs to yours um, and with this with this um, with this presentation I was very elated that I was going to write something about this um, I actually recorded this um, uh, I actually recorded this yesterday, but due to the inefficiency of my laptop, it didn't save, or it wasn't, um, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't properly saved. So it, it wasn't properly recorded, which is a shame. Um, but yes, I enjoyed making this topic. I hope this provided a lot of insight. Um, again, I am Isabel Marie Ortiz Chua, um, always my middle initial. Uh, this is my final requirement for IT era. I'm a first year BSMLS student. Um, thank you for thank you to um, Professor Marmelo Abante for guiding me through everything. And I hope that um, we can all. I hope that all of my lessons of the botany and now media literacy can serve as information. Uh, thank you for listening.